I'm Beth Schubenstein. I'm an orthopedic surgeon here at Hospital for Special Surgery. Today we are operating on a 55-year-old woman who's had long-standing bilateral knee pain that has really been debilitating for her over the last 10 years. She can't kneel, she can't squat, she can't get out of a deep chair. She came to my office about a year and a half ago and we talked about non-operative treatment and we did a bunch of injections and some physical therapy, but still the pain really was present and, and limiting her in a lot of what she did every day. So we came to the conclusion after looking at her films and talking about the options that she would be a great candidate for a partial knee replacement. This is a unique type of partial knee replacement. When we think of partial knee replacements, the knee is, a, is a, like a three room house and there is a medial or inside component. So there's the inner side of the knee, which is the medial side. This is the distal femur. This is the tibia. This compartment is one compartment and you can see it has the bone on the top and the bottom or the femur and the tibia. It has good cartilage, which is this gray material as well as a nice meniscus. So this room or this one third of the knee looks very healthy. We look at the other side, which is the lateral compartment. It looks very similar. In fact, they are almost mirror images, not quite, but they function in the same capacity, which means that they function in order for you to walk. You, it is your weight bearing part of your joint when you're standing or walking, jumping uh, or running. And this side also has good cartilage on both sides of the joint. That's this gray material as well as the meniscus. And so this is not her problem. And in fact, the x-rays of both knees, you can see that the joint spaces between the inside and the outside look very good. Where we see this woman's problem also correlates with her symptoms. If you look at the lateral view, there's no space between the patella and between the trochlea or the femur. And then that is really mirrored on this view. This is a, called a merchant view, and this is where we see the patella in its track. And what we see is that on both sides, she has complete bone on bone arthritis on the lateral side of the patella femoral compartment. And so she has what's called malalignment arthritis. The kneecap has sat in a position where there's been much more weight on one side than the other. The analogy I often make is if you took a school bus and you asked all the kids to move to one side, that school bus would still drive. It's a big machine. It's not going to topple over and the knee still works. But if you put a pressure gauge under those tires, you would clearly see that one side, the pressure is much higher with all the kids on it than on the other side. And that's exactly what's happened to her over the years is she's just had much more pressure on this side of her kneecaps. And so over time, just like the tires would wear out in that bus, the cartilage has worn out on just this side. And so we see that over here, when we look at the, again, this image that shows us good cartilage in the other compartments where there is no malalignment, and when we look at this view up top, this is the image that we're looking at with the x-rays and we can see an empty space here. Here's her patella, here's her trochlea. And I'm gonna show you where there still is cartilage is on the inside, but you see all these little cysts on the outside. And that's because the pressure has been so high on the outside of her patella over time that just like in these views, she's worn away all of the cartilage. And so what we're really talking about today is doing a partial knee replacement and just resurfacing the part where she's lost the cartilage. So again, if we think about the knee as three compartments, she has arthritis that's really limited to one compartment. The other thing that's really interesting about patellofemoral replacements, which is the type of replacement we're doing today, is that the survivorship or ability endurance of this operation and success of this operation is actually determined by the reason that people have arthritis. So if somebody has arthritis because they've had instability in their patella and their kneecap is dislocated many times and they've knocked off cartilage, we can tell with good confidence that likely the arthritis is gonna be isolated to that compartment because there's a reason for it. So it likely won't progress to the rest of the knee. Anytime we do a partial knee, the concern we have is when will that patient begin to deteriorate the other two thirds of her knee or his knee? When will they need a total replacement? Because what we don't wanna do is we don't wanna do a partial knee replacement and then five years later have to do a total knee replacement. That's just too much surgery and it means we didn't see it coming and we could have done a total and saved them the extra operation. In this case, because this patient has this type of arthritis, which is called malalignment arthritis, that's that extra load on one side, this is a very good indication for this operation because what this means is there's a real reason for why she developed arthritis in just this compartment. 
and she likely won't progress to the other parts of the knee very quickly. And so that means this operation can last her maybe 15 to 20 years and maybe even longer than that. So today we're gonna do a partial knee replacement. We're gonna resurface the patella and the femur for this patient. We're gonna recover this. I'm gonna show you what that looks like because I did her other knee six months ago. So this is what it looks like from the front in terms of the covering that we put on the femur. And this is what it looks like. The comparison shot is looking at the patella. She now has nice space. There's a pretty even uh, amount of tilt, meaning she has a tiny little bit less space on the left, but nothing like she used to, and she's not slid over at all, which means that we've done the job we set out to do, and now we're gonna do it on the other side. So we are doing a little bit of a different approach today than common approach for medial. The most common approach for this is a medial parapatellar arthrotomy on the medial side. But because of her type of arthritis, which is malalignment arthritis, we're gonna do a lateral approach so that we can also treat the subluxation and tilt. So the first thing is just to develop what we call a mobile window. We try to do these through relatively small incisions. If you can develop that window, you can actually do the same surgery, but through a much smaller incision. And again, normally, we would come medial parapatella on this side. We're gonna actually come along the lateral side. I'm gonna switch you out over here. So first we're gonna do our lateral approach and we're gonna try and find that layer here first. Mm -hmm. That's that layer that is between layers two and three and then we'll do the arthrotomy. There's that layer. So this is capsule and this thick tissue over here is retinaculum and we've split them because we're gonna use that extra tissue to close over the lateral lengthening. And it looks like a very flimsy piece of tissue when you get in there, but you, you guys saw last week how, how well it closes, so it is a nice to be able to slide it and not get a hernia. So now we're gonna make our lateral parapetal arthrotomy, and that's what we're gonna close at the end of the case. So we're gonna take that down, preserve that piece of tissue. So when you're coming down always, whether it's medial or lateral, you want to be able to feel the meniscus mm -hmm. and take it in steps so you don't violate the meniscus. Obviously, we're not doing a total, so you want to make sure you can protect it. And then what we're going to do is we're going to flip that patella. So I'm going to come back down by you. This is the piece of tissue that we lengthened. So that's what we'll be able to close at the end is that piece. And that's what's going to give us the extra length when we slide it against that retinaculum. So again, it doesn't look so impressive, but at the end of the case, it's kind of nice to have that and it prevents you from having to devascularize both sides as we talked about because you're not going through the medial side so you're preserving blood supply so this is an example of what i call an acetabularized patella and we call we, we talk about that in the shoulder when there's proximal humeral migration but you can see it's now a cup right it's, it's created a socket and what you're measuring, and this is where you have to be careful, is you're measuring that medial side. You really don't want to go much past 12. I have had cases where I've had to go more. It's not ideal. Okay, so that reads about 18. We're going to try and get as far medial as we can with it. Okay, flip it. Good. All right, so you can see the, you can actually feel it, which is like the uh, central facet right there, right? She kind of carved out that. We're going to try and kind of come down along that ridge over there. This is the reamer we use to try to be concentric because otherwise it's pretty challenging. I'm going to take a look at what we got here. But my guess is just based on it. Yeah, we have to go one more. And we're going to try not to go to 12. We're going to try and leave it at like 13. Yeah, okay. That's good. You can come on out. So I can see lateral already. So this we know is concentric, which is great. This is still very thin, but at least it gives us a good base. So the overstuffing in the patella, not as much of an issue, especially with these guys, because their patella is so thin to begin with, right? The normal, so you're kind of reestablishing and hopefully it actually helps with the quad in terms of the function when you reestablish it. So I don't see overstuffing as much as you do in total.
So again, you have to remember your side medial, right? Medial yeah. not, it's kind of counterintuitive, but that's what we're gonna do. And we'll be able to take off a nice big chunk of the lateral side, which is great, right? Okay, we'll do a 32. So that's what you can do here, which is really nice is get to the lateral side and do as much of a lateral facetectomy as you can. Uh, can you lift up, pull up vertically? Yeah, if you can, there you go, perfect. Okay. Yep, perfect. And so that one obviously harder for Joe to do because it's lateral and it's all sclerotic. Okay, so all of that's gonna go, right? And so that's the facetectomy. I'm gonna be taking off this bone, which is the lateral facet, facet. And it's a little challenging because we just tried to preserve that lateral side. So we're gonna try and take it off actually. Let's use a bovie because what I don't want is to kind of uh, violate that lateral. Sometimes you end up a hole with a hole in what you just tried to preserve. That's it for the patella. Now we're gonna flex up. So it does make the femur a little bit more challenging, same way that it makes the tail a little more challenging because your retractors do exactly what you want them to do. Let's see, we're gonna push her up a little bit. Here we go. Okay, great. And then what we're doing right now is we're gonna define white side's line. Okay, that's great. So she's not post instability, but she definitely has some trochlear dysplasia. And so when that's true, you kind of want to follow white signs, but you also want to check the transepicondylar axis just to make sure. So it's a way to verify. And then this is what allows us to dial in either native external rotation or more external rotation. And the reason to put these two lines here is because once we put this guide on, we're going to actually block. And she's got a little rangeur actually right in the center. There we go. So about two millimeters above kind of the notch. This is the intramedullary reamer. When you come out, just make it wider, and then we'll suction it. And this is our guide. So this sets rotation and also height, right? So you gotta be mindful of kind of how much trochlea you're seeking. So now we can see pretty, you have pretty good access to the superior aspect. That's what we need to see in terms of height. So first we check height and then we check rotations. Good. So this is what we're setting height with. And you want to check rotation. So if you were looking on this side of me, if you guys can see, you can see the parallel lines I drew, but this central bar obscures the deep central line. That's why you draw parallel lines so you can still assess rotation. So right now, right now I'm probably in her rotation and I'm going to dial in a little bit of extra external. And if they're instability patients, then I typically dial in a little bit more. And again, for people who have instability, I'm probably more aggressive about the external rotation. the one cut that is the one cut here that sets everything else because based on this that's kind of what you're you've bought your external rotation you can always try to recut it if you want to and for patients who have significant trochlea dysplasia you will take more for patients who have less you'll take less for a normal trochlea you would only take a couple of slivers and you'd get these two little holes that look like that baby grand we're going to take a two so this one is important this is a two right you want to confirm these have three feet. You see the gold? There's three little clips. You want to make sure that the gold is covered so it's in the middle position on both of them because that's going to set kind of how much trochlea you take. And a two looks good. What you don't want is you don't want to over cover because people look at this, but what you're really looking at is the edges of the trochlea compared to her trochlea. And so I always go for under covering the bone because what you want to look for is where does this ride? And if this comes off a little bit, then you end up with impingement and you want to make sure both of those feet are touching. The other thing that can happen here, depending on the quality of the bone, is that it can extend the jig, especially with this one. So Joe won't put this one all the way down. So this is the milling guide that mills out the trochlea groove. You can even see the component is only fixed proximally, right? So, so sometimes it's helpful if somebody puts something down over here, kind of like a tamp. Thank you. One of the things that happens with this guide is especially the two, is the two gets overused. Can you mount me? Yeah.
What we're going to check now is we're going to see the congruency to the rest of the condyles. We care much more about congruity here, which we have perfectly. Mm -hmm. This side actually looks pretty good, but they don't always. And the more, uh, the more dysplastic they are, the, the less symmetric the medial and the lateral condyle and distal trochlea. So you're always going to default to caring about the lateral side. And that's really important because sometimes this is over recessed. It's okay. It'll fill in because obviously the tracking is always going to be lateral. Trial. Thank you very much, Margaret. Got it. This is the trial. So you want to make sure that you're down top and you're going to ask those guys on their side if they're down. Yep. Now you can see this is a little over recessed on that medial side. Do you see that? Slightly. This side actually feels perfect, mm -hmm. but again, that's the side you care about. So let's look over here and make sure we're down. We look pretty good on our side. How about you guys? Yep. Good. Okay. Now we're going to trial the patella. And because we did this laterally, we hopefully don't have to put any anything on it. So typically on that medial side, uh, we have a little bit of a rent. We'll try and get that in a second. But with the medial side, sometimes you put something to check tracking. What you want to see is that it doesn't pull laterally or medially and it stays center. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing you want to do is be able to put your hand here and make sure at the transition zone, you don't feel a large step off or a clunk or something telling you you're transitioning into deep flexion, meaning off the component. So now we're gonna take these out. We're gonna irrigate the joint. Thank you. Okay, now we're gonna irrigate. There's a little hole in our capsule from where we took that osteophyte out, you know, before. So we'll put a little ovicrol in there and just kind of make sure it's stable beforehand. And so you can definitely feel this transition is definitely more congruent, only slightly by a millimeter, but when you decide which one, it's definitely this one. So that looks good. Turn it down, please. All right, so that's, uh, that's pretty much it for this. In terms of the major issues, patella is just like any patella, but we do take a little bit more time because our patellas with this look very different than total knee patellas, right? Total knee patellas look pretty concentric. Every once in a while, you do get a concentric patella, and that's the primary OA patient, right? So the question is, well, what's the survivorship of that? And the answer is, you know, we, we don't know. We can tell these patients if they have no medial or lateral wear yet that they are likely going to progress to getting it at some point because this is just the first presentation. But when you see concentric or primary OA, you should have that conversation with the patient. Doesn't mean you don't do it. You just counsel them that this is a bridging operation, right? That we're doing this as a way to relieve pain now, but that likely over the next 10 to 15 years, maybe even sooner, they may progress, especially if their parents have arthritis, right? So that's one of the things that I definitely talk about is this concept of a uh, bridging operation. If they know it's a bridging operation, it's not, it's not a failure. It's actually done purposefully so they can enjoy their quality of life when they're in their 40s. And then when they're in their 50s, they can have a total knee. I try not to do these in patients that are too young because obviously the clock is ticking. Um, so I do like to try to get them to 40 if I can. I have had one patient who was uh, 29, my youngest patient. She'd had nine surgeries. She had no other choice. But the concern, which is the same concern with all arthroplasty, is bone stock, right, especially on the patella. So you want to leave those patellas as thick as you possibly can. And then the other thing that you want to watch out for in patients that have malalignment OA, which she does, and have that acetabularized patella, is you want to look at the thinnest side and how wide their patella is. Kind of the kiss of death for them are the very small women with who have very medial laterally narrow patellas because then you don't have the option to shift it far medially, right? So you can use this. We've had one where we've used the special, we've had a few where we've used the very special kind of custom sized patella, but you do want to be careful with those because sometimes it's so excavated that you, you know, it's paper thin. So in patients like that, sometimes I'll counsel them that you might not be able to actually do the replacement, right? You might just be able to resurface one side. I've never had that happen, but it is something that you need to think about with those uh, significant malalignment OA. Biggest issue with these patients post-op is their quad. 
So it is different um, than patients who have a total knee where you can let them just walk afterwards. These patients, I always tell them that their most difficult thing will be what was difficult before. So they'll have the most difficulty with going up and down stairs. Walking will become pretty easy for them within two weeks, but that was pretty easy for them beforehand. So stairs take a while, probably about three months until they can do reciprocal stairs and probably into about five months until they're back to doing everything. There's a little hole right over here, which we can repair, but otherwise we have a pretty good piece. Yep, so here's the retinacular yeah. layer. I'm gonna detach a little of that. Oh. Thank you. So we'll start by just kind of tagging this to this. So this is the extra piece. Mm -hmm. We're going to repair that afterwards. So I'm going to check tracking and then I'll let you guys finish closing. So first you want to just check. She has nice medial lateral glide now. She was really tight before. I don't know if you got a chance to feel her, but she shifts now, now kind of equidistant on both sides. There's no tilt when you put your finger over here. There's no tilt, which is nice. And then a ho hopefully, yeah, and you can see a really nice smooth tracking with no, no significant shift as you're watching her move. And then as Joe did, kind of put his hand here into deep flexion to see that there's no catching or clicking.